Wednesday here at The Life. Yours truly, Terrence, Elder Terrence Bennett, uh, praising God and thanking God for another chance to share the Holy Writ of God with you today. We also like to give thanks and honor to our, our Bishop Harold and Pastor Felicia Duncan for allowing me the opportunity to come and share with you today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you right now. We honor you. We bless you this day, oh God. We thank you for another time to share your holy word, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for the privilege to come behind the sacred desk to declare your holy oracles, oh God. We pray the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You are my Lord, my strength, and my redeemer. Lord, speak through me that they may hear. In Jesus' name, amen. My assignment tonight is dealing with the covenant of grace. First of all, we want to deal with the actual word covenant. The word means a contractual agreement between God and man. It establishes the basis of a relationship, conditions of that relationship, promises and conditions of the relationship and consequences if those conditions were unmet. But we also want to deal with the word grace. And it means the generous and spontaneous gift God gives us in spite of whether we deserve it or not. The grace of God is free and totally unexpected, yet also undeserved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 states, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man should boast. The covenant of grace promises eternal life for all people who have faith in Christ. God also promises the Holy Spirit to the elect, to give them willingness and ability to believe. The covenant grace wide, is widened from the Old Testament to the New Testament and is administered first with small families like Noah and Abram, then with the nation of Israel, and now with the church, which is made up of people from every tribe, language, and people and nation. It is also administered in the Old Testament through what the New Testament authors call types and shadows. The covenant of grace is the covenant between God and humanity that was established by Jesus Christ at the atonement. God entered the covenant of grace, bringing them to an estate of salvation by a redeemer. And because the covenant of grace is more active, is now used more active before. I mean, is it is a shout for it. it is the continuance of the covenant of works, which deals with the pre-fall agreement between God and Adam, in which Adam was promised blessing and life upon obedience to the terms of the covenant. Genesis chapter two, verse 16 and 17 says, he tells Adam, you may freely eat of every tree of, God, of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat of. For that day you will eat of it. For that day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That's what you call the covenant of works because of the fact that, that Adam disobeyed God by doing just that. But it also, in, in, it also continues on into the covenant of redemption, a precursor for the covenant of grace, which states the eternal agreement between the Godhead in which the father appointed the son to become incarnate suffer and die as a head of mankind to make him an atonement for their sins. 
The Bible says in Galatians 3.13, yet Christ paid the full price for us to set us free from the curse of the law. He observed the court. He absorbed the curse completely as he became a curse in our place. For it is written, everyone who is hung upon a tree is cursed. Jesus Christ dissolved the curse from our lives so that in him all the blessings of Abraham can be poured upon, our gen upon Gentiles. And now through faith, we receive the promise of the Holy, promised Holy Spirit who lives in us. The grace of God operates more in an effective way. The believer looks to grace for salvation. As we look, we look to grace for grace to be super abounded. It outdistances the increase of sin. Romans 5 and 20 says, the law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. 2 Corinthians 9 and 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God takes advantages of the negative functions of the law of sin in order to exalt himself in order to exalt his grace and in order to foster his saving purposes. The more sin is multiplied, the more it is shown to us, the more aware we become of it, the more aggravated it is, the greater is the grace that conquers it. And the more that grace is known and appreciated, the reign of sin, the reign of sin is trumped by the triumph of grace. Grace meets sin head on and defeats it. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses five and 17, five, verse I'm sorry, Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 15 through 17, says this. I, now there is no comparison between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift we, that we experience. For the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It's true that many died because of one man's transgression. But how much greater? Will God's grace and gracious God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many become of what one man, Jesus, the Messiah, did for us. And this free flowing gift imparts to us much more than was was given to us through the one who sinned for because of one transgression, we are all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But the disgracious gift leaves us free from many, our many failures and begin, brings us into the perfect righteousness of God. Acquitted with the words, not guilty. Death once held us in its grip. And by the blunder of one man's death, reigned as king over humanity. But now, how much more are we able, how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom 
through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah. It says, there is no comparison <laughs> between Adam's transgression and the gracious gift that we experience. For the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. That's what grace does. It outweighs the sin that we have done. Yes, true enough. When we fell into sin, we had dealt with eternal damnation, with separation from God. But one of the things I learned about grace is it brings you back to God. It gets you back in, back in formation with God. Yes, many died because of the sin, or we call it transgression. But the thing of it is, is God's grace trumps, as they say, the sin that so easily beset us. How much greater will God's grace and his precious gift of acceptance overflow because of the fact that, that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus took our sins. Jesus took everything. The Bible says he who know no, knew no sin became sin and became the propitiation of us, or they say the sacrifice for us. It is because of the fact that the Jesus Messiah did die for us and the free flowing gift, which is grace, imparts to us much more of what was given through the one who sinned. For because of one transgression, we are facing the death sentence. Because of our sin, we should be, we should be sent to eternal damnation and in the words of the court, be judged guilty. But because of the right standing we have with God, through the grace of God, we get the non, not guilty plea. That means we've been acquitted. That all the wrong that we have done and everything that we messed up, the things that should have been, that should have killed us, that should have took us out and separated us from God and everything, grace said, I'm wiping it off. Is because of his grace and his mercy. I say it again, we yet live, move, and have our being. Thank God for the grace of God. Because grace, knowing that you ought to be rejected, if someone knew that about you in fact, you ought to be rejected by God, but grace comes and says, I trumped the sin. I conquered the sin. I justified the sinner. I destroyed the old man. I raised him to newness of life. I gave him a new life here. I give hope, him hope. I give him hope in eternity. And all those things that you are afraid of your friends knowing about you, grace deals with it. Not because God didn't somehow know that you did them or didn't know that you were that way. But he knows you better than yourself. In fact, he knows some of the things that you don't know yet about yourself. And in grace, God comes to us and says, I know exactly who you are. And I know exactly what you're like. It is the covenant of grace. One of the things I learned, I love about the grace of God. We mess up. We still get forgiven. God is still a forgiving God. 
We, obey, we disobey God so many times. Lord knows, present company included. But it's because of the grace of God, we still yet live, move, and have our being. Like the Bible says earlier, for by grace we are saved through faith, not of our works, let any man should boast. We've been saved, we, we're not saved just because of the works that we've done. No, no. But we are saved because the grace and the mercy that God has given us. In the covenant of redemption, it was what they call an inter- Trinitarian covenant. That was a situation between God and Jesus Christ. They figured out how. They worked out how. What the situation was going to be for us. God told the son, you have to go to the earth and die to save the people from their sins. Covenant of works. It was the situation between God and Adam, but it was conditional. You had to do what he, God told him. You had to do exactly what I tell you to do. That was before the fall. God, our Jesus Christ now is what they call the second Adam. That's where the grace comes in. It trumps everything. It trumps everything because if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would not be here today. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, we would not make it to where we are right now. I'm grateful for the grace of God. I'm honored by the grace of God because it has saved me from myself. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I'm grateful for the grace of God. Father, I thank you. I bless you and I honor you today. Thank you, O oh God, for this gathering, this time of sharing together, O oh God, of your word. And I pray, oh God, that what has been said today would bless someone, would touch someone, oh God. But I pray most of all, God, you get the glory. You get the honor and you get the praise for it, oh God. Thank you for the grace, your grace, oh God. One songwriter said, your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too. Because it was your grace and mercy that brought me through. Bless us and keep us, O oh God, this day. In Jesus' name, and we thank you. Amen. Oh, God bless you. God keep you. If this has been a blessing to you, we want to recommend Give the Five. It's most trusted source using of giving for your tithe, offering, and gift of love. If not, you're more than welcome to call the church. The number's on your screen for giving your debit card or credit card, or you're more than welcome to come by the church. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Friday. The address is on your screen to send in your tithe off and gift of love. And if you're ever here on Sunday morning, service starts 9.30 with intercessor prayer, 10 o'clock for service, and you're more than welcome to drop your offering in the basket at the back of our sanctuary. Until next time, yours truly, Elder Terrence Bennett, wishing you peace, love, and the blessings of the Lord be with you always. God bless you and see you next time.